Um, today we're looking, we're continuing, as Kenny said, the story of Jonah. The story so far. God has called Jonah, who's a prophet, to share his word, God's word, with the people of Nineveh. The people of Nineveh, we, are, we know from what it says, are wicked and evil and violent. Not a nice combination, if you ask me. Um, and also, they are the sworn enemies of the Israelites. So, chapter one, Jonah doesn't want to do this, and he runs away. But he soon discovers that you can't run away from God. Chapter two, we witness Jonah, Jonah having a change of heart. He realizes that he actually needs God more than God needs him. And he cries out to God for help, and he turns back to God. And in response, he is vomited out of the mouth of a fish onto the beach, which is quite an image. And I, don't, I, I wouldn't ask you to ponder it if you're contemplating your Sunday lunch. But it, you can just imagine that. I mean, the smell to start with. But anyway, we won't go there. Now we get to see what happens next. Um, and Callum, Callum Gubby, who has been playing the organ at the 9.30 service and has rushed home, is now going to read for us Jonah chapter 3, verses 1 to 10. Over to you, Callum. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. Fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself in sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued to Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. But let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows, God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Callum. That was brilliant. So what do we notice about this? Well, here's some of the things that I noticed. Firstly, how God's message to Jonah is exactly the same. OK, so hello there. It's me back again. He, he doesn't say take some time off. He says we have got unfinished business. I think you are just the right person to, to go and say the, this word to the people of Nineveh. So please don't put it off any longer. And it has to be said that for Jonah, the, the, the task is quite a daunting one. I mean, we're told he has got to speak to 120,000 people. That's pretty big. That's, I think, twice the size of Perth. I mean, that's a lot of people. Um, and we're told the area takes about three days to walk through. So it's not just the city of Nineveh we're talking about here. It's the surrounding towns. It's like the whole region. He's got to go and talk to them and share God's word with them. And on top of that, for them, he's going to be a stranger and he's going to be a foreigner and he's going to be an enemy. So it's very unlikely that they're going to actually want to listen to him at all. And I was thinking about this and I was thinking maybe... Maybe that's something that you yourselves can relate to. Maybe you've had a sense in your past that God is calling you to do something that you think is absolutely impossible. Like there's no chance that you'd be successful in doing it. And so you've sort of shelved it or shuffled it to one side or filed it away or got really busy or whatever. And it's still sitting there waiting to be done. One of the lessons of the book of Jonah is that when God calls us to do something, he doesn't ask us to do it on our own. In fact, the task he is calling us to do is not our task. It's his task. It's God's task. 
God already knows every single person in Nineveh. He already knows them. He, he gave them life. He's been with them every day of their life. He has watched them grow. He knows their thoughts. He knows the, their deepest needs. And he knows that the time is now right in their lives for them to hear this word that he wants Jonah to share with them. He just wants Jonah to be the voice. He already knows that the time is right. Now Jonah has already learned his lesson. He knows that God knows what he's doing. But it's still about 500 miles from where Jonah is on the beach <laughs> in Israel to the great city of Nineveh. So um, I'm not going to burst into song, it's all right, but it would take Jonah probably about a month on foot to get there. So that's a month. And every day he's thinking, oh, oh, I don't know how well this is going to go. I don't know what my reception is going to be like when I get there. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, is this, am I really doing the right thing? And you can just imagine that every day he's getting closer and closer to Nineveh and every day he's not sure whether he's doing the right thing at all. I mean, am I mad? He's thinking all the time, but God's told him to do it. So he goes on. And when he finally gets there, notice he doesn't hang about. He doesn't procrastinate. He starts proclaiming the message straight away. And the message is, Nineveh has just 40 days to change her ways. If not, in 40 days she'll be overturned. And the Hebrew word that is used here for overturned is the same word that is used for the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. So this is something really quite serious that God is threatening the people of, of Nineveh. The message is very clear and it's very serious. And you have to take your hat off to Jonah because it would have taken some courage for him to share it with these people who, who looked on him as a stranger and an enemy. And how did the terrible and wicked people of Nineveh react? This is the best bit in the story. This is the bit Kenny was talking about earlier. Did they say, what nonsense? Did they say, go away, you madman? Did they say, lock that man up? He's the enemy. Put him to death. Did they say any of these things? No. They take what he's saying seriously. It strikes a chord. It hits just the right note at just the right time for them. And with hindsight, you realize that God has already been involved in their lives. Even before Jonah came, here is a people created by God, every single one of them made in God's image, just like the rest of us. Here's a people who, like all of us, still have an inbuilt sense of right and wrong because we're made in God's image. Before Jonah even arrives, the Spirit of God would have been at work in their hearts. Stirring their consciences, opening their minds. They already would have had a growing awareness of all not being right in their lives, all not being right in their society. You know, a growing unease. Should we really be behaving the way we're behaving? Should we really be allowing people to get away with doing the things they're getting away with? A growing awareness of the evil that they were part of. A growing awareness of the suffering they were causing. All that was there even before Jonah came. So Jonah's words are not the cause of their repentance, but his words are the trigger. His words are the catalyst. And at once, his words trigger a reaction and it snowballs. It goes viral. It causes a chain reaction. And it spreads throughout the entire city. And I'm reminded by the story of Jonah of another story, a parable that Jesus once told. He says, the kingdom of God is like yeast mixed into dough. Now, I know you probably all know David Colley. Uh, what you may not know about him is he is a great baker of bread. And if you happen to sort of stray into the, the Kirkgate Cafe on a Tuesday and ask for soup, you'll get some of his bread with it. And it is absolutely delicious. Absolutely delicious. But if you ask David Colley about yeast, he'll tell you that without the yeast, the bread's not going to rise. How much yeast you can ask him? Just a tiny little bit. 
That's all you need, just a tiny little bit of yeast. But you mix it through the dough and it all rises. Jonah's words were like that tiny little bit of yeast. They, they caused a chain reaction. They went viral. And the people listen because it's just the right time for them to hear those words. And they respond. And the news spreads and they're telling each other. From the greatest to the least, everybody hears, everybody takes notice. Even the king. The king dons sackcloth, covers themselves with ashes and sits in the dust. Imagine a king doing that. Imagine our queen doing that. It's a sign of humility. It's a sign of repentance. And then the king issues a decree. Everyone should fast. Everyone should give up their wicked ways. And who knows, says the king, if we do this, God might relent and change his mind. Who knows? God might change his mind. And to everyone's relief, he does change his mind. He does relent. At last Tuesday's uh, teen prayer time, we have a teen uh, prayer time on Zoom every week just for half an hour, just to sort of check in with each other, and make sure we're not going mad, make sure we're all right, and we pray for each other and we share. But someone always shares a thought. And it was Emily's turn to share a thought last Tuesday. And the thought she shared was from Ezekiel chapter 33, that God takes no joy in the death of the wicked. God takes no joy in the, the death of the wicked. God would have taken no joy in the death of even one of those Ninevites. Why not? Well, because he created them too. They were part of his creation. He loved them too. He cared about them too, just as much as he loved Jonah, just as much as he loved Israel. And in fact, that is one of the central themes of the whole book of Jonah. Um, and, and it's a theme that Jonah finds personally quite hard to accept, as you'll see next week when we encounter grumpy Jonah. But anyway, that is the central theme. God cares for every single one of them and their animals. And I'm reminded of Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. We too are commanded to love our enemies and to pray for those who persecute us. Listen to his words. I'll read them for you. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be sons and daughters of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous because he loves them all. When we love our enemies, we are showing ourselves to be sons and daughters of our Father in heaven. When we love our enemies, we are becoming godlike. For he loves his enemies as much as he loves his friends. We know that because of Jesus himself. Remember on the cross, he asked God to forgive his father to forgive those who would even put him on the cross. Why? Because he loves them. When we love our enemies, now here's the thing that's when they notice. That's when they notice our faith and are amazed. When I was a teenager, my uncle, my uncle Alec, gave me a book, and the book was called Miracle on the River Kwai, and it was by a captain, an artillery captain, I think he was, called Ernest Gordon. And I think the reason my mum, my mum, my, my, my uncle Alec gave me this book was because he himself was a POW in the prison camps on the River Kwai, and it's all about what happened, about this amazing miracle that took place amongst the prisoners of the Japanese during the Second World War, how they rediscovered faith, how they experienced a sort of Holy Spirit-led revival. Instead of just looking after themselves and, and, and scrabbling for every scrap of food for themselves, they started sharing and they started looking after each other. 
And, and they rediscovered the power of the Holy Spirit and it carried them through the rest of the war in those prison camps. And one bit that I particularly remember, I remembered it when I was thinking about Jonah and the Ninevites, was in one incident that happened late on towards the end of the war, a train load of Japanese soldiers comes through and it's full of wounded Japanese soldiers. They've been on the front line, they've got themselves wounded, and they're in cattle trucks being taken to the back of the, the line. But for some reason, because they were no use to the war effort, they weren't being well treated by the Japanese themselves. So they weren't getting much medicines, they weren't being given much food, they weren't really being looked after at all. They were herded in these cattle trucks and shunted down the line. And they, their train stopped outside the POW camp, and the prisoners from the POW camp gathered together what medicines they could and climbed onto the train and ministered to their needs. And they were astonished at the love, something they hadn't expected from their enemies. Here are two things that maybe we could take away with us today. First is a question, who do you think of as your enemies? Who do you think of as your enemies? And it might be people from another country or people from um, another religion or people from a different community or, or just individuals, people are giving us a hard time. Who do you think of as your enemies? Just think about that for a second. And then ask yourself, Am I able to love them? Am I willing to pray for them? Am I willing to share with them the gospel of Jesus, that he died for them too? You know, if our faith is to make any impact at all on the lives of others, it has to be lived out in our lives first. And the biggest test of our faith, I think, is whether or not we are able in God's strength, not our own strength, but in God's strength, whether or not we are able and willing to love our enemies. So that's the first thought that we can maybe take away with us today. And the second, is there something God has at some time called you to do for him that at the time you just thought was impossible? And you thought, no way am I doing that. I'll just leave it. Someone else will do it. I'll just put it to one side. It will go away. Is there something like that that God has called you to do? And if that's the case, then maybe today he's given you another nudge. Like Jonah, you're being given a second chance. Maybe there's someone he wants you to speak to. Maybe there's someone he wants you to do something for. Remember, like he did with the Ninevites, God will already have prepared the ground for you. All he's asking is for you to sow the seed. Because that's how he works when he calls us to do something. We're not going to be asked to do the whole thing on our own. We're just going to be asked to provide the spark. And who knows, like Jonah, maybe that spark will start a, something that will go viral. Some, maybe it'll be like the yeast that spreads through a whole batch of dough. Maybe a, just a very little thing that God's calling you to do will result in a whole bunch of lives being transformed. Shall we pray? Loving Father, we thank you that you know us better than we know ourselves. You know our deepest thoughts, our deepest secrets, our deepest fears. And you know that when you ask us to do something. You already know our weaknesses, and yet you still ask us to do something. Knowing that we're not going to be doing it on our own. We're going to be doing it as part of your plan and in your strength. So thank you for that. And please show us how you want to use us to share something of your love in the world around us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.